progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we look to open the word of the Lord in this new week, shall we ask his guidance so that we may better understand that which he's presenting before us in these chapters and judges? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have before us your word, the word that you would have us to examine, to understand, your word that you would have us to eat. Help us today to partake of this that you are trying to tell us, to be guided by you, to be directed by you so that we may more clearly understand the path that is before us. I thank you for those that are joining with us today. I thank you, Father, for this word. I thank you for this opportunity we have to open it, to study it, to come before you, to seek your face, to seek and understand that which you would need us to know for this time in earth's history. Direct us now, guide us. For this, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, the premise that we were looking at in Judges chapter 2 this last week is that it is Christ that is the messenger of the Lord that has come up from Gilgal to Bochim. That this angel has come from where the nation had been assembled in the near future to select its leaders to Bochim, which are the weepers. As Christ is noted, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Three times he refers to himself in the promises that are given to Israel. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? The fourth time, he notes that the children of Israel are not obeying his word. They are to make no league. They are to throw down the altars. Now, why is it in this situation that this is being noted? We can see that the children of Israel have disobeyed. They have made a league with the Gibeathites. Now, comment from the chat is that we should look at Joshua 4.19. Why? What is important about that? And what, how does that support what we're talking about? Uh, I just thought there might be a link. It says the people came out of Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. Okay, so this is after they have crossed the Jordan and before. Jericho is taken, correct? Right, right. So this is a remembrance. Now, is this at or after the time of circumcision, or is it before the time of circumcision? What? How? How do we see this?
I'm trying to remember when they got circumcised exactly. Yeah, it's in Joshua 5 that they're circumcised. Okay. So in other words, this is just before the circumcision that they yeah. come to Gilgal. So could we say that it is at Gilgal that they are circumcised? Yeah, well, it would be. It must be, yeah. So a and the Passover to celebrate. Yeah. So the question I have here, because... This section in Judges, it's it kind of jumps around a little bit, right? Right. So it's going to then talk about the death of Joshua in you know verse six. Um, uh, well, not quite in verse six. In that section, starting in verse six. So when the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. It, can we place when that's occurring? Because this could be reflecting going back to something earlier. Well, <clears throat> did Moses <clears throat> make a league with any of the inhabitants of the land? Well, no, Moses didn't. Okay. So we know that Joshua did allow a league to be made with the Gibeathites, right? Mm -hmm. So the statement in Judges 2, verse 2, ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice comes subsequently to the league with the Gibeathites. Mm -hmm. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, I would think so. Okay. <clears throat> so, I would also have to think that this is subsequent to many of the tribes and their failure to completely take the land. Because in not taking the land, are they not still allowing the Canaanites their altars and their method of worship? Mm -hmm. So how's this, how's this answering my question? Well, you were you were saying that this is jumping around. Yeah. When does this occur? Well, it would occur after the league with the Gibeathites. Just how long after is the question. I'm having to wonder if this is not within a short time before uh Joshua calls the people back between the mountains of the blessings and the curses to repeat this to them. Okay. Because and, wasn't, yeah, wasn't place that. what was that? But what can help us place it? Is there anything that can help us place this other than guessing? I don't see that we have a, a fixed date here. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm looking here in the spirit of prophecy. 
This yeah. is um, Review and Herald, September 25th, 1900. Uh, it's an article entitled Self-Exaltation. And um, so she's referring to this event. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land, etc. Um, then she says, the people bowed before God in contrition and repentance. They offered sacrifice and confess to God and to one another. The sacrifices they offered would have been of no value if they had not shown true repentance. Their contrition was genuine. The grace of Christ wrought in their hearts as they confessed their sins and offered sacrifice, and God forgave them. The revival was genuine. It wrought a reformation among the people. They remained true to the covenant they had made. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord. Their sins were repented and forgiven, but the seed of evil had been sown, and it sprang up to bear fruit. Joshua's life of steadfast integrity closed. His voice was no longer heard in reproof and warning. One by one, the faithful sentinels who had crossed the Jordan laid off their armor. A new generation came upon the scene of action. The people departed from God. Their worship was mingled with erroneous principles and ambitious pride. So it seems to me that maybe in Judges that this is reflecting back upon this earlier repentance for their sin of making a league. And um, so it's just kind of putting all of this history into this short statement going up to the death of Joshua. So it seems like Ellen White's putting it much earlier um, in, in the in the time of Joshua, after they had sinned in making a league, but, you know, not long after that. But, um, but that's the only thing I can find. That's only one place that she mentions Bochum. The experience that they were having at this time, that you were reading at the beginning of that paragraph. Yeah. How like the experience in the upper room was this? Well, I think there's some par parallel, and in, in Ellen White's putting in this in the context of self exaltation um, and how is showing the Israelites as an example of repentance and humiliation. But is that not in confessing their sins, in accepting that they have not adhered to the word of the Lord, is that also not what we see occurring within the example were given of the upper room prior yeah. to Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what I'm saying. It, it, there is a parallel. Okay. So in Judges 2, verse 2, have we been guilty in making a league with the inhabitants of the land? Adventism has, and so has this movement. So therefore, if we are going to accept the fact that Adventism and the movement have been guilty of this, are we not to accept the guilt of this personally? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How would we know how to throw down the altars? Um, well, throw down the altars of the inhabitants of the land. Well, that would be through, um, through Bible study. Agreed. Yeah, so it's, it's, I mean, another metaphor would be, 
you know, separating the precious from the vile, that type of thing. We, we have things, elements mixed into our movement, not just intellectual ones, but even in how we operate and do things um, that, that don't come from God, they come from the world. You know, especially in the elements of how we organize. Um, you know, because Adventism, if you look at the original organization that was done, I mean, it was it was fine at first because the church was small, but as the church grew, they needed to become more decentralized. And, um, you know, when this movement tried to organize in 2017, it was really the organization made no sense on how they were trying to organize. They were trying to pattern themselves after the worst aspects of, of Adventism. Uh, they were trying to organize by centralization, which, you know, it, that's not what Ellen White calls organization. All, all organization comes from a connection with Christ that connects, connects us with each other. So, so when it comes to the problems that we see um, and how we assert our so-called authority, uh, the type of patience we exercise towards those who are erring, and, and the way in which we labor to, for the individual, um, all those things this movement and the church has not learned how to do. I think, that, I, I think the movement and the church have chosen to set that aside. I agree. They haven't learned how to do this. Yeah. The one thing that's always bothered me about Adventism is uh, nominating committees. Or even board meetings, for that matter, the way in which they, they operate. You know, so for a nominating committee, let's say you're even on the nominating committee and they're going to talk about you. You have to leave the room. On what basis, what scriptural basis is there for such um, a, um, a policy? Shouldn't everything be done openly? Shouldn't yes. a person be present when somebody's going to speak words about them? Because, I agree. Because the type of abuse that occurs is things can be said about a person and 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 that person has no way to defend themselves. You know, board meetings that are secret, any kind of secret meeting to me is totally contrary to the gospel of Christ. Agreed. Yeah. But, but those things, secret meetings, uh, are a big part of this movement. And not just with Parminder and Tess, but even with the School of the Prophets. My sense of humor has um, has always had a um, a different path. I mean, in English, when we speak of board meetings, we speak of B O A R D. Yeah. But I usually find them to be more as B O R E D. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> my experience with board meetings. Um, when I was in academy, they used to have an administrative council meeting or an ad council meeting where different members of the administration would get together to address issues with students or with other things that were going on. My senior year, because I had a driver's license at that time, and because I was a senior, I had worked for the grounds crew. And the grounds crew, part of their responsibility is to take the garbage to the dump. So there would be days that I would be assigned a, um, a sophomore to go with me. And we would go take the garbage to the dump. <clears throat> it was always surprising to me the number of times we would find the records from the ad council meetings sitting in the garbage. 
Mm. And they were complete. And we would get to read exactly what they had been addressing and discussing. And some of the times their decisions were so far off the mark, it wasn't even funny, but it was the decisions that they had made. Mm. Now, the Lord gave instruction that you will make, you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And the question is being asked, why have you done this? What the people have done is being exposed. It's being directed right back at them. <clears throat> why have you done this? Why are you not accepting my word? And this is a question I think that all of us are going to have to answer directly. Why have we not accepted the word of the Lord as it is written? We all have the opportunity to search his word. We have the opportunity to come to understand his word. We have this opportunity to do this for ourselves. Yet, many ways and many times, we take the word of the Lord and we choose to accept the word of man as being the equivalent of the word of the Lord. When we do this, we are no better than the children of Israel because we are then making a league with the inhabitants of the land. So this is a difficult lesson to learn. I mean, I would look at, you know, gossip, uh, any sort of political maneuvering, uh, the type of censure that's gone on in this movement, uh, the party spirit, uh, cliques. Um, all these things are, are after the world. They're not after Christ. And, and often people look at this in this sort of narrow sense, you know, uh, basically, I'm not going to make league with the inhabitants of the land. So you cut yourself off from other Christians and from the church and, and throwing down their altars. They look at him much more, you know, just directly dealing with worship ideas. Right. But this really has to do with the whole principle of what worldliness is, which we don't seem to understand. Mm hmm. We, we look at its, its external manifestations and not the root cause of what worldliness is. So, so we can think, you know, like the Pharisee, that we're more righteous than others because we do certain things correctly. But yet, you know, the weightier matters of the law, we ignore and transgress. Comment. Yes, please. Um, you know, it seems to me that much like Israel, or I, I would say Joshua as well, um, you know, as you said, you think you do, we do, sometimes we do things right, and so we, we don't seek the Lord in everything and seek his, his teachings, his his ways. Joshua, you know, uh, apparently they when he made that when they and, and the leaders made that league with uh, with them, they uh, they didn't, they failed to consult the Lord or to seek his face to find out the truth or go back to the words that he had spoken before and realize that, hey, this is this is something he's told us not to do. Uh, many times we just jump out there and Oh, this this is what I saw done at work, or I saw this done at another church, or whatever, and we don't go back and seek God's word to know the truth. 
and, and to see his ways um, seems to me that is a big thing. We just jump in feet first and, um, you know, this all seems good. So let's go with it without consulting the Lord. Was the Lord aware that the Gibeathites were lying when they came before Joshua? Mm -hmm. If the Gibeathites had come before the Lord or had come before Joshua and the people and spoken truthfully and put themselves at the mercy of the children of Israel, would God have respected that any better? Would that then not have been a league, but have been someone that was coming with a spirit of contrition rather than a spirit of falsehood? Yeah, and if Joshua then had that situation arise, he probably would have gone to God and consulted him. So are we not being shown that from the leadership on down, that this error was made? Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the people, it was the people and the leadership of the children of Israel that together did not consult God. That thought is, for me, very fearful because we cannot afford, as a people, as a movement within this world, not to have God's guidance, not to seek God's guidance, in these situations that occur. I mean, Elder Jeff was really direct. As I went back over some of his presentations in Daniel's last vision, he was very clear that he saw it that he had sinned in trying to pass the mantle on to Parminder, that he had no direction that he was to do this. Here again, leadership and the people sinned <clears throat> because at that time, as he is trying to place the mantle on to Parminder, he is acting very much as Joshua did in entering into this league with the Gibeathites. Yeah, I've wondered about that. I was actually thinking about that as we were going through this. You know, because, I mean, I've told this story before. Back in 2016, uh, Jeff and I were picking strawberries in his garden, and we had a conversation. He was going over the history of all the different people he had trusted who had betrayed him. and. And he said, you know, that he's not, he never trusts the right person. And, and you would think that that would have, um, you know, he, he would have learned that lesson, especially by the time we got to Parminder. And, and I always wonder, well, why did God allow this all to happen? I mean, you know, I mean, we can see now, I mean, it's sort of what was going to happen, but, you know, and, and I can't think that Jeff wasn't praying about things, but he acted, as he admits, without God's guidance or direction. And, you know, I don't know what, why exactly that happened, what was going on in his heart, but, and I'm not like blaming him, um, because I just don't know the circumstances. But it definitely was a mistake. I'm just taking what Elder Jeff said, mm -hmm. his own words, yeah, very directly. 
Now, in this, in this type of situation, was Elijah operating according to the word of the Lord when he stood before the children of Israel, when he said, choose you this day who you will serve? Mm -hmm. But was he operating according to the word of the Lord when he is awakened after this? and informed that Jezebel wants to kill him when he ran from Jezebel? No, he's not. So shouldn't Elijah's experience have taught him anything? Well, yeah. Um, well, let, let's look at it this way. So, um, you know, so Jeff had experiences. We, we, have, we have the experiences of the past. I mean, Jeff is looking at Miller's experience, and one of the reasons Jeff stepped aside is he didn't want to influence uh, the movement after July 18th. And I think that was very wise on his part. He didn't want to make the same mistakes as Miller. And, you know, we when we look back at Adventist history, so when you, you look at at, at this movement and you look at yourself even as an individual you have to take those characters in the bible and in adventist history as lessons to us so that we don't make the same mistakes they made and and if we can you know through god's spirit see in ourselves aspects of our character that are similar to those in the past who made mistakes you know, our hope is that we cannot make the same mistakes, that somehow we can learn from other mistake, other people's mistakes. That's a very hard thing to do. Apart from the Spirit of God, I don't think it's really possible for us to learn from other people's mistakes. Somehow we think that we're immune. You know, we wouldn't have crucified Christ, or we wouldn't have done this, or we wouldn't have done that. And yet we do the same things all the time. We just don't recognize it. You know, our guard is let down. So. Well, as we had studied and we had addressed before, one of the comments that Mrs. White had made that has struck at my heart hugely when the message of Revelation 14, the third angel of Revelation 14, was presented before the leadership of the General Conference in 1888, that she saw that if Christ himself had come before that leadership with this message, mm -hmm that they would have crucified him again anew. That for me has been a very fearful statement about the darkness that had en enveloped the leadership at that time. Mm -hmm. Here we have <clears throat> Christ himself coming up from Gilgal to Bokim and making personal statements. I made you. I have brought you. I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. An angel could not have said this. Yeah. This is Christ alone giving this comment and this instruction. Uh -huh. So this is something I think that we, we need in our experience to choose whether we're going to accept this or if we're going to set it aside. Now, if we're going to accept it, if we are going to eat this flesh 
and drink this blood. It's going to have to be something that is going to be a personal revelation for us. Mm -hmm. That then leads us into a more corporate experience. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we look at in Adventist history is we know the Adventist church became a denominated people in 1863. And there was a lot of people who opposed organization. Uh, But Ellen White didn't. Uh, But often people don't understand why she didn't. That is, she recognized by that time that the movement had lost its power that the church was Laodicean. An organization was a result of of the fact that the church wasn't really being led by Christ. The individuals weren't following Christ. They were caught up in other things. And, And that's why Christ didn't come back at that time. Now, our movement was calling for organization in 2017. But that really didn't make sense to me, because what I saw 2017 to be was Pentecost, that the type of organization that was going to occur was not going to be the type of organization that happened in 1863, but the type of organization that happened on the sixth day of the third month in 31 AD on Pentecost, which is really a different type of organization. And, you know, it's just like when Israel received a king. Uh, Did God support that? God allowed it. He allowed it, but he also, in a sense, supported it, right? Only because they, they had to make their choice. They had rejected him, and so they were going to get a king. And the same thing happened in Adventism. And... And, and it's human nature to want a king. Somehow the people feel that they're, they're safer, they're more secure. But it takes away the individual responsibility. So, you know, this movement, I believe, is being called to a connection with Christ. That what I see in the spirit of prophecy about the final movement is that it's people directed not by some church structure or some organization to do a work. It's people instructed by God's spirit with angels going before you, leading you to the people who are searching for light. It's something miraculous, not something designed. Human machinery, Ellen White says, it's not going to be due to human machinery but to the unction of the Holy Spirit. And that's that's a difficult thing because it requires us to be converted. But here you here you see at Gilgal, so so if we're going to place this, we're going to place it practice really practice our faith. Yeah. And so we're going to place this event prior to uh, the sanctuary moving to Shiloh, right? Could very well be, yes. It, it would it would have to be because uh, the messenger of the Lord Christ he comes up from from Gilgal, and so that's where the sanctuary is. It's, it wouldn't be in Shiloh at this time. So so this is telling us about some event that it doesn't specifically mention in the book of Joshua. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. So, but it, it's happening in the time of the book of Joshua. So it's going back over this and mentioning this this repentance basically for their sin. So why, and, and we've sort of addressed this a little bit, but why is it in this context? What is Judges chapter 1 and 2 trying to do? What is it setting up? Because we're taking it as as a letter to this movement. Well, 
that's part of the premise. The other part of the premise is that what we're going to be studying throughout this book of Judges is going to be righteousness by faith and the examples that we are given of righteousness by faith in this particular book. Mm -hmm. And we're given examples in, in sort of the worst condition of the people sure. you know, af after the Exodus. I mean, they, they sinned against God during the time of the Exodus, but we're going to see these people who are weakened because of their choices, but what again and again being delivered by God. And they're given the opportunity again and again to walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. Now, Ellen White says about Leviticus 26 that it received a partial fulfillment in the time of the judges, but a complete fulfillment in the captivity captivities of uh Israel in Assyria and Judah in Babylon. Right. Uh, um, I'm trying to see, remember if she says how she words that exactly. Um, just hang on. Yeah. So, um, so she refers to, uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus 26, so Deuteronomy 25 and Leviticus 26. And she says, this prophecy fulfilled in part in the time of the judges met a more complete and literal fulfillment in the captivity of Israel in Assyria and Judah in Babylon. Satan had made repeated attempts to cause the chosen nation to forget the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments that they had promised to keep forever, Deuteronomy 6.1. He knew that if he could lead Israel to walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, they would surely perish, Deuteronomy 8, 19. Okay. Now, what is the quotation, please? Uh, that's um, Patriarchs and Prophets. Um, Uh, page 296. Thank you. Okay. We're going to put our, our virtual finger here in what we're talking about in Judges 2.2. We're going to skip ahead a, a little bit. And we're going to also cover this a second time. So this is going to be something for our consideration over this week. So if we, if we jump down here. Judges 2, 14 and 15. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Now, the reference that's being given here in Judges 2.15 intrigued me because you don't often find a reference given in this manner. The, those that worked in translating this from the various languages in the Bible will generally give you a verse or a selection of verses to consider. But when we're talking about this in Judges 2.15, the translators gave reference to complete chapters. And they gave reference here for us to see Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Mm -hmm. I believe it's been addressed in the past that these are companion chapters. Sister chapters. 
Aren't sisters also companions? Yeah, but I've always used the term sister. Okay. So in this case, we have Leviticus 26, which are the curses. Does that mean also that Deuteronomy 28 is also the curses? Yeah, it has the curses and the blessings. They both do. But Leviticus 26 is where we experience and we read about the experiences of the seven times. Right. Yeah. It goes into more detail in the chronological nature of how that's going to unfold. So the situation that we're being shown is that by entering into a league with the nations round about them and by not throwing down these altars, the children of Israel then entered into the curses because they had set aside the word of the Lord. Now, any thoughts or comments over what I've just said? Well, we're just going back to what Ellen White has said. So if, if Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 are a, a partial fulfillment of, are partially fulfilled in the period of the judges, right? right. Um, this, this means it's a working out of the blessings and the curses. And that, um, and, and if we understand what the, the, Levit the blessings and the curses are, they are the gospel. Agreed. Right. So they are the practical working out of the gospel to these people in the period of the judges. They're <laughs> illustrations for us of what God wants to accomplish. And he's taking people in, in pretty bad shape spiritually, people who have wandered away from him, them, from him. And, you know, righteousness by faith is about God redeeming people from sin to make them reflect Christ's character. Um, you know, when it comes to the period of the judges, it, it for me, it's it's always been a difficult section. One is to sort through it. But even difficult in the sense of what's trying to be illustrated. You know, how does this? Why is it how does it relate to? Sense? Yeah, well, difficult in, you know, from from a human point of view, it's like why are they constantly falling away? What is it that God's trying to show us? Because he leads people out of Egypt and, and, you know, he has Joshua, you know, first Moses, then Joshua. And then we have this long period of constant uh, rebellion against God. And yet God is still merciful through this whole period. And, and then they finally get to the point where they ask for a king as if that's going to solve their problem. Uh, because they constantly, you know, it says here, um, uh, wherever the, yeah, Ellen White says, I think it was in the Ellen White quote. Um, I can't remember. Oh, maybe it was here. When they went out, uh, wherever that was. Um, I can't remember. Where, um, yeah. Yeah, in, in Judges 2.15, whithersoever they went out. That's referring to their military battles. So, right. so in the Christian life, is it sort of like that for us? That we, we constantly are losing these battles. And, and I guess the problem with Judges, it just kind of hits too close to home. But it has to. Yeah, I know. 
but but you understand now why you, you, the problems I have. It's not like a, a problem that I should have, but it's a problem that human nature has. We would want to read the Bible and see all of these heroes who are just victorious. That's what the world likes to see. But here we see these very human uh, heroes, if you want to call that, the characters in the Bible. And, and yet this is about us because we are without God. Well, one of the comments that has been made to me several times had to do with the chapters in Judges from chapter 17 to the end of the, of the book. Yeah. Because it had been stated to me multiple times that this example is so very different from anything else that you find within scripture. Why is it there? Now we went through that portion. Mm -hmm. We looked at this, but we took it in the light of to whom was this city given? Mm -hmm. And when you start to understand that this was given to the very leadership of the church at that time, and that they were acting no better than the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. it's giving an expose, a blunt expose of why we cannot and should not ever be trusting in man. Mm -hmm. Which includes ourselves as well. Did I say anything different? No, no, I know. You didn't. Yeah, so it, it's, um, I, I don't think it's characteristic, though, is, is any different than any place else in the Bible. But it's definitely a little more graphic and a little more shocking in how it's presented. But, I mean, we see this all through Scripture. I mean, that's why I became a Christian over other religions, because it speaks the truth of humanity, where other religions don't. They try to make us feel good about ourselves. All the way through, mm -hmm. other religions will try to make a person feel much better about themselves because they don't want to examine the root cause of sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sin is excused. Too many times. And even in much of Christianity as well. Sure. But God's character, as written in his law, does not excuse sin. Mm -hmm. when when i saw this and putting this putting these notes together and as i was led to consider this that the translators are giving this reference to these two full chapters so that we today would understand that whithersoever they went out the hand of the lord was against them as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that whithersoever we go out in promoting the rewritten books of Ellen White, that where we go out and abandon the advice that she had given and setting aside portions of the Bible that the word of the Lord is against us as well. Mm -hmm. And we know the word swear here in, in verse 15, when the Lord has sworn unto them. Yes. But that's, that's the seven times. Yes. Shabbat. Brother, Brother Dwight. Yes. 
What did you mean by rewritten books? The great controversy has been rewritten where they have taken out many portions and many chapters to make that book more smaller. friendly. Yeah, more smaller. Yeah, okay, I, I understand. They are doing the same thing right now with the Desire of Ages. Oh, okay. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, the, the word 7650 in Hebrew from Strong's Concordance, it, it occurs 186 times. Really? Yeah. Anyway, that's an aside. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so you're talking then. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not as concerned about the rewritten books of Ellen White as I am about the books of a new order, where Adventist history is twisted and warped and. Uh, the spirit of prophecy is belittled, minimized. Right. And, I mean, I mean, it depends, I guess, which books you're talking about rewriting. Because I know that um, uh, Robert Whelan did that condensed version of the Conflict of the Ages series, which was actually pretty good. I mean, it doesn't change anything she said, just tightens up some of the language. But... Um, what, what I'm referring to uh, here a few years ago, the General Conference put out a, a very rewritten version of the great of the great controversy. Yeah, so it took out a lot, all the historical references to the Catholic Church and so forth. Yes, agreed. Yeah, they made a big thing of this that this was going to be an amazing evangelism tool. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and it's no better to me than questions on doctrine. It's an abomination. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I find about the book, The Great Controversy. Sorry, Jay. That's how you talk about the great hope. That little, yes, I am. Great hope. Oh, yeah, no, you're right. The thing that bothers me the most is, is I really think that The Great Controversy, it's it's the beginning chapters, the historical record that that attracts people the most to that book, and and that they rarely understand the latter part of the book, but but it, it, just in reading that book, it prepares them so that when the time comes, they will understand it. You know, you know, I've I've heard uh, every time I turn around, I hear people saying where. Well, we need to make that book smaller so that they they can read it. But you know, I ain't got no education, and I can read that book, the big book, not the small book. And it just t just bothers me that people would take out everything in the great controversy, just put it into one little book, and think that that's going to tell the story. That's right. right. No disagreement, brother. Mm -hmm. So as we return to where we had started from, mm -hmm. wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. God is telling them in advance that he's not going to go before them. He's not going to drive out these other nations. That they're going to be ensnared and trapped by the other gods and the other manner in which these other nations live. And that they're going to be led away from true worship.
He's saying this in advance. He's telling them prophetically what's going to happen. This chapter of Judges has great application post-1844 for the Adventist church, and it has great application for us in this movement after 2005. We've been talking about 2013, 2014, 2017, 2019. July 18th of 2020 was taking the word of the Lord just as it is written and was giving full reliance that God was going to do exactly what he said he would do. A message of warning has gone out. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me when I go back over several things that are still on the internet, how the church is yet still trying to distance themselves from what we as a movement presented because they did not like the fact that Ellen White had written that Nashville would be destroyed. They didn't want to make a big thing of it. I think for many of them, it would be an embarrassment. It's a huge embarrassment. There are those that used to be within the movement that have joined with others like Steve Wolburn to say, yes, Ellen White wrote this, but it's not something we really need to worry about at this time. But it's a message of warning. It's a message of warning that was to go out a hundred and five years earlier, or hundred, excuse me, 115 years earlier than it did go out. And there are still many that are embarrassed and believe that a great apology should be issued. I look at this, I shake my head because should an apology have been given to those in Jericho when the children of Israel marched around Jericho before the walls came down? Should an apology have been given to the to the people of Ai? Should an apology have been given to those in the later chapter of this book of Judges that came before the house where this Levite of Judah was staying with his concubine, seeking to have immoral relations with him, just as those in Sodom and Gomorrah had wanted with the angels that came on the lot. Well, and also Nineveh, would you apologize to Nineveh that it wasn't destroyed? Exactly. Because here's Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, receiving a message of warning. And from the king to the least man in that kingdom, they chose to repent. We can look at Jonah in many different ways. But he was one of the most effectual evangelists that ever lived. Because all of Nineveh listened to his warning. If we gave a message right now and all of America listened to that warning, that would be a miracle.
So as we continue through here, and they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. So they've called the name of the place Weepers. Yeah. Now you're going to address where this actually is too, correct? I haven't been able to look it up yet. Oh, okay. Do you have a map that would show it? Well, they, they don't have a place called Bokim on any maps. Okay. Um, the suggestion is that it's Bethel. That it was the house of the Lord. And okay. where does this suggestion come from? Um, well, I'd have to go back and trace the scriptures of, of it. Um, so. so they say it's either by Bethel or is Bethel. Um, when you look at both, when you look at it on a map, it'll just give you Bethel. Um, so, so Bokim Habokim, a place of the mountain west of Gilgal, said to have been so named literally the weepers, because Israel kept there in the remonstrance of the angel. Um, talks about Judges 2, verse 1 to 5, but they just mark it as Bethel. So, so that's one thing. So they don't have Bokim as a separate place. Um, and um, trying to find where I had. Yeah, it was. So, you know, I don't know how it would necessarily be proven um, other than oh, where I'm, I'm trying to find where I'd looked before. Um, so this one guy goes through it and... Anyway, I just thought you had you were going to go there in that direction, but um, I'd have to put it together a bit more about this. But but that's generally the view that's understood, and um, like this one guy who wrote a book or an article called "Bokim Bethel and the Hidden Polemic," Judges two verse one to five. Uh, it's a Jewish writer. And uh, he deals with this. He's one of the places I looked. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so I'm gonna have to if, to answer that question. I'm gonna have to give you. Uh, I'm gonna have to have a bit more time. Okay. But I thought you had you had mentioned something about where this place was, but you hadn't really looked it out, looked up. Looked no, up. I hadn't. Okay. So is it is it possible by the end of the week that you might have a better idea to to help us understand Bokim and, and where it is? Um. Yeah. Uh, I'll see what I can do. So the, so the Septuagint identifies it as Bethel. The Jews identified as Bethel. Um, but they had some reasons for it, and I just can't find those right now. It would be interesting if, that, if, if we accepted that as being the case, because are we not told in Ezekiel 9 that the judgment is to begin at the house of God and Bethel being the house of God would be a, uh, an intriguing symbol. Mm -hmm. As we went through this from some of the writings that Mrs. White had, 
about those that are sighing and crying for the abomination in the land. My application that I was led to make was that Bokim were those that were those that are crying for the abominations of the land. So that's why I was being led to make the last day application of this name with the movement today. So as we continue, and when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. Now, when did Joshua let the people go to their inheritance to possess the land? Was that not after the second time that they went between the mountains of the blessings and the curses? Because they assembled there before they started taking possession of the land. And they assembled there after they had taken possession of the land shortly before Joshua's death, right? Mm -hmm. So is this verse not a repeat of what we were reading in Joshua 24 about the death of Joshua? Or am I applying that wrong? Is that a hard question? No, I, I think you're doing it right. Okay. So as we look at this, the translators would have given the reference here. From Joshua 22, 6, and 24, 28. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went unto their tents. And then Joshua 24, 28. So Joshua let the people depart every man unto his inheritance. So the support would be to the second time that Joshua called the people together. The support would be to the time where he had called the tabernacle from Shiloh to come back between Gerizim and Ebal. where they came again to the altar of Joshua. <clears throat> and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that prolonged days after Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Perez, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. Where they buried him. is interesting because there seems to be a difference of opinion as the name. We have Timnath Herez being shown in Judges 2.9. But when we come down here, let's see. Joshua 24.30 said, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath, Sarah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gaash. 
why the difference in the name, and what is important about him being buried on the north side of the hill of Gaash. Any thoughts? Well, um, okay. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah, I don't know what they said. No, I was just wondering if nor North North or faces Jerusalem, the North. Well, when I'm looking at this, Timnath Harris, according to Esord and Strong's, we would be looking at a portion of the sun. But yet when I'm looking at this with the hill, Gayash, we're talking about a quaking. So are we not talking about a shaking? Okay. Um, okay, so before we get to Gayash, dealing with Tim Nasira or Keres, they're, they're actually just the last part is just spelt backwards. So it's it's a you can spell the word sun frontward or backwards. It still means the sun. I don't know why this is. Well the okay in the English I see what you're saying that this that Timnath is spelled the same way, but the suffix Harris is spelled differently from Sarah because we, you have H E R E S and the other portion is S E R A H. Yeah, I know, but if you look at it in Hebrew, it's Chet, uh, Rosh, uh, or Resh, and uh, um, uh, Samak, and and the other way, it's the opposite. Samak resh chet. So, what so, is that telling you? Well, I think it's it's a Hebrew uh, play on on words or something. It could be sometimes they will do things; they'll change the spelling of something because it um, relates to false worship, right? So, you know, you would change somebody's name, like, um, instead of putting Baal at the end, you would put, uh, what's the name? Um, I'm trying to think of the guy, the son there of uh, Saul. Um, the different ways his name's pronounced. I just can't think of the word offhand. Um, but one means shame and the other means Baal. So they'll put the word shame in the place of the word Baal. Uh, things like that. So it must be something to that effect. You mean you mean Gideon and Jerubal? Uh, no, no, not them. Um, uh, oh, I can't think of the guy's name. The son of Saul. Jonathan. Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth. Yeah. Instead of Ishbael. Okay. Is boshet, shet, you know, ish boshet. Boshet means shame, and and Baal, of course. So it's either uh, the man of Baal or the man of shame. There you go. So so things like that happen in Hebrew. So it could be here that that's why they switch it around, but I don't know particularly why they do it. They just do. But it's still going to mean sun. Right. It's a portion of the sun. Either way you, you spell it. But we're also looking at this on the north side of the hill of quaking. Yeah, of gosh.
So that's where it's located. Well, it's 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 on the north side of the hill of Gaash, the the portion of the sun, the city Timnath Harris or Sarah. Okay. But in this situation, he's buried on the north side of a hill that we could believe would be facing the sun. Could this be a reference to his resurrection? Hmm. Well, he's built, buried in this city. I don't know if he's buried on the hill itself. But, um, but it says directly on the north side of the hill of Gaash. Yeah, well, it says in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gaash, which is where Timnath Heres is. Right. So, so whether he's buried right on the side of the mountain or not, or the city's just on the north side of that hill. Um, I don't know if that's clear. Okay. Because I just think it's north of the mountain of Gaash, not on it. Like, like that's where the city is. But anyway, so it's the hill country of Ephraim is another way to translate that. But I, I don't know the significance of it. Um, so you're trying to say that it's quaking that relates to the resurrection? Well, I'm asking, I mean, we're also looking that he was buried on a hill of quaking. Now. Was he buried on a hill that gives us a, a representation of a shaking time? That they, this leader is being removed from Israel before Israel goes through a great shaking. Could we make this application with Elder Jeff? I mean, within this movement, we've seen several shaking times, whether we're talking about the book of Joel, whether we're talking about the situations with Parminder and Tess, whether we're talking about July 18th of 2020. All of these have been shaking times. When we look at the, the situation that occurred with December 6th, this again became a shaking time. Our faith has been being tested. Every time that the faith has been shaken, it has been tested. The question is, how do we come out of those tests? Any thoughts? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Uh... Well, we want to come out of the shaking standing firm in Jesus, right? And Agreed. Every time that we see our faith being tested, 
every time that we have that experience of our faith being tested? Are we holding more firmly or are we choosing to let go? Hopefully, we are holding more firmly. Could we maybe see uh, Tim Nafsira being like the person of the sun, uh, being connected with Mount Ephraim? So Ephraim would be Israel, the short reigns, the Protestants, which could mm -hmm. represent the United States of America, and Tim Nafsira in the Sunday law in America, and then the north side of Halagash, so there's relates to the earthquake. Um, maybe relate that to maybe the second com second coming after the the Sunday law in America. I don't know. It's a nice way of putting it. And it goes right in right in line with this pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes sense. It does. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Before we go into the next section, I think we have reached a point for the close of today's study. We'll pick this back up again tomorrow. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, shall we close with prayer? Loving Father, thank you for these examples. Thank you for these words of warning. Thank you for sending your son to show us the pattern and the way that we should be walking at this time. Help us today to consider these items that we have read. Help us that we may keep our feet firmly on your path, that even in the shaking that we may hold on to you, that we may hold on and not let go. Direct us to this end. Be with us today. May your character be shown before all with whom we come in contact. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.